I'm Mark Steiner, and we're here in Washington, D.C. It's the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. It happened on August 28th, and I was here. Literally, in the spot where I'm standing now, I was like 50, 60 feet that way, standing with the folks from Baltimore, Maryland, and Cambridge, Maryland. We, our buses are parked about two or three blocks away. And if you look around here, you just imagine what this place was like with two 150,000 people, 250,000 people all around this mall, everywhere. And the joke some of us had was we were between the Lincoln Memorial, Freedom, and the Ku Klux Klan, which was the Washington Memorial. Look at that memorial. Doesn't it look like the Klan? It looks like the Klan. So that was kind of the, the image some of us had, at least on the more radical side. It was a there were, there were, it was this huge interracial crew. Black, white, Mexican, Puerto Rican, men, women of all ages. It was, it was just, it's hard to imagine the breadth of people that were here from union officials to revolutionary activists. And there was something that people don't talk about enough, I think, which is that there was a, there was a socialist air to it all. If you read the speeches, listen to the speeches, there was a socialist air to it. Demands for workers to have rights. Demands for unions to be able to unionize. Demands for black folks to be out and be in unions and make a living wage. Demands to end slave wages in America. That was all part of this. Because it began as kind of as a march for jobs. And then it expanded when the civil rights movement got in it. And it became jobs and freedom. And so it was this massive, broad group of people that it, like America had never seen. America had never ever seen this before, ever. I think history was written today which will have its effect on coming generations with respect to our democracy, with respect to our ideals, with respect to the great struggle of man toward freedom and human dignity. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm Mark Steiner, and welcome back to The Mark Steiner Show. And uh, that little video you saw, it's just the beginning of this, of what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to tell ourselves back to 60 years and talk about where we are now. A march on Washington that took place when um, my friend Larry Gibson and I were much younger. <laughs> Larry Gibson is with us. He's a University of Maryland Law School professor, longest serving professor at the law school, still teaching. They can't get him out. He doesn't want to go out. He wants to stay there and do what he's doing. He's there. And uh, he's the author of Young Thurgood, Making of a Supreme Court Justice, working now on his second book on Thurgood Marshall. Uh, a scholar, a man who put mayors into office and more in his lifetime. And uh, Larry, it's good to really ha this is fun to have you here, man. It's fun. I'm looking forward to this. I can't believe that 60 years <sighs> have passed uh, since the March on Washington. But... Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And Max Alvarez is here, who's the editor-in-chief here at The Real News. And guess what, folks? He's taking over today. <laughs> <laughs> right. I kicked, I kicked Mark, Mark out of uh, the host chair, so I hope everyone will forgive me. But, um, yeah, I mean, I really didn't want to miss this incredible opportunity uh, as you mentioned, Mark, uh, and we were down in D.C. Uh, shooting what uh, viewers and right. listeners just heard uh, yesterday, we are releasing this special edition of the Mark Steiner Show on uh, August 28th, uh, 2023, 60 years to the day from the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, one of the most storied days in American history. And one of the most impactful days in American history. And both of you were there um, yeah. on the National Mall, like by the Lincoln Memorial. Like, I mean, I've only heard about this incredible day my entire life, seeing pictures in black and white. And and I guess like it, as as a millennial, you just sort of assume that it's just so far back in history that- <laughs> Nobody's alive. <laughs> well, because that's kind of how it's taught. But then right, right, the very right. fact that I am literally sitting here with both of you uh, to talk about your memories of that day, what led up to it, and, and to talk about the legacy of the March on Washington, 
I want to just underline for people watching and listening to this that it's it wasn't that long ago, no. right? I mean, like we we're here having an intergenerational dialogue, but we have so much to learn from you both, and and so much of the struggle that brought y'all to Washington sixty years ago, as you mentioned in that video, Mark. We're we're still fighting those fights today, right? And so I want us to talk about all of that with the next uh, 45 minutes that I've got with you both. But I just wanted to thank you, Larry, and thank you, Mark, for humoring me and, and sitting down and, and chatting with me today on Mark's show uh, for this commemorative special edition um, uh, on the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And um, I mean, there, there's so much that I could say about that day, but I mean, I feel like because it's such a memorable moment in American history, there's a lot of context that, that people have absorbed just by living here, by, by hearing about it so much. But I know there's also a lot that we haven't heard about. And there are a lot of details about the buildup to the march and, and the state of the country at that moment in history that that has kind of been lost to history. And so I want to talk to you guys about your memories of that moment. And we're going to go in kind of three stages. We're going to talk about the buildup <clears throat> to August 28th. And we're going to talk about the day itself and what you guys remember about it, what sticks out to you. And then we'll talk about um, the legacy of that day and the state of the struggle 60 years later. And so I guess without further ado from me, I wanted to kind of turn it back to you both and ask, um, yeah, all the way up until August 28th, 1963. So, so uh, up until August 27th, 1963, who were you at that moment? What do you remember about yourself? What brought you to, like, to Washington? And... Tell us about, you know, like what you remember about the buildup to this day, how it happened, how it how the event almost didn't happen and anything else that you think that that comes to memory that, that you think folks out there watching and listening probably haven't heard uh, in the popular telling of this history. So, Larry, why don't we start with you? Well, I was a student at Howard University and I was the active with a group that we call then nonviolent action group that became the Washington chapter of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Many of our classmates would uh, leave school and go, go south. So I remember the uh, most of our activity prior to that involved sitting in, sitting in mainly in pl uh, restaurants and other places of public accommodation. Some of those involved coming back here to Baltimore. I'm a Baltimorean, but I was a student at Howard, and uh, I very much enjoyed when we came back here and, and sat in. And in fact, there's one memorable occasion uh, when the, uh, my group had five restaurants uh, we, had to, uh, we were responsible for. I remember one was the Harvey House, the Eager House, the Gorsuch Lounge. Our last one uh, was the uh, Oriole Cafeteria. 5300 block of uh, York Road. My group was four, maybe five people. I think, I think it was four of us. But unlike the other places, this was a cafeteria. Uh, before we would go in, they would kick us out, and our group had to get to all five. So if you're going to get arrested, the instruction was you couldn't get arrested until you, you got to your fifth restaurant. <laughs> well, we get to the Oriole Cafeteria, and we walk right in, there was nobody at the door, and to the right, uh, were uh, around the right side, there was food. So we, we grab things and go back to where the cafeteria, I mean, where the cashier was expecting to get kicked out. And they started ringing it up. <laughs> well, first of all, I didn't have the money. <laughs> I had to borrow some money to pay for my food. But worse than that, as I sat there, as we sat there looking, <laughs> expecting the cops to come at any minute, I looked down at this meal, which I had grabbed. Uh, it was baked fish. I'd never had baked fish. Baked fish in my family, fish in my family was fried <laughs> and it was brown. <laughs> this was yellow <laughs> and, and it had some sort of sauce on it. And the other was what I've come to call my sit-in salad. It was that salad that has carrots and raisins and, and mayonnaise. 
I, it, it actually has a name. But they, 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 in fact, I was getting angry. You know, y'all don't serve black people. What are y'all, <laughs> you try to embarrass me. When are you going to kick us out of the streets? <laughs> and the interesting thing is I discover later that that building has been broken down and there's a CVS there. That's the CVS that I currently use for any, uh, uh, for any medicines. But anyway, getting back to the march, much of the planning of the march was at Howard uh, University because it was going to be in Washington. You had uh, uh, lots of civil rights involved uh, students around uh, a nonviolent action group. And I remember distinctly a couple of meetings where Byatt Rustin uh, uh, came and uh, one of them, uh, A. Philip Randolph, came with him. And I'll never forget A. Philip Randolph's voice. He oh, had yeah. a powerful, distinct uh, 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 voice. And uh, another close friend of Byatt Rustin was a good friend of mine named Tom Kahn as they planned the, uh, the, 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 the logistics. And I was sort of impressed with the little details that they were talking about. It was, I mean, I was accustomed to participating in demonstrations where the issue was where we're going to start marching and where we're going to end marching. But no, they were planning the, the spotter pots and the various health stations and the little minute uh, uh, details that were uh, necessary to pull this uh, thing off. So it, that, that, that was my recollection, that we had been mainly demonstrating, but now these were sit-down planning of meetings. I mean, the most planning I had done of a civil rights demonstration is uh, who's your team, and if you're going to sit in this restaurant, are we going to get arrested or not? That would be, a, that would be the extent of our planning. But though this was very careful planning uh, out to how to carry a, a, this thing out. Uh, and I was just imp impressed with the level and the detail. Mark, what about you? Where was I? 63 was... Um a seminal year in my life. Um, it was the year I was expelled from high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I, school was not on the top of my agenda in 63. It was either being part of the civic interest group, which was Baltimore's arm of SNCC, sort of, like NAG was in Washington, that did Route 40 Freedom Rides. Um, we went up and down Route 40 trying to integrate restaurants and where I got my first broken nose. And um, it was, um, and then there was, and we also had the citizens in, in Baltimore and voter registration campaigns and all the stuff we were working on then. And we worked with our, our assist organization in Cambridge, Maryland, the Cambridge Nonviolent Action Group, uh, which was Gloria Richardson, who was this larger than life figure um, who ran the movement there. And so I was involved in all that. I was also at that point in the, <laughs> I, I, I was the joke. I always the joke is I was a teenage trot. I was a member of the Young Socialist Alliance. I joined that when I was fifteen, <clears throat> and so I was deeply involved in in all kinds of movement stuff. Um, and um, the March on Washington, um, it was. Uh, so I was part of the Civic Interest Group, and we had our own bus that went down from Sharp Street Methodist Church which is where the headquarters of CIG was, off of Pennsylvania Avenue, which was the f folks, not in Baltimore, I'd say, it was Baltimore's 125th Street. It was the main drag in the west side of the black world. And um, so it was a hot day. And the funniest part of that being a hot day was that going to D.C., I, I was trying to look good. I was 17. <laughs> you know, I wanted to look good. And so I had this, this long sleeve knit shirt on, and it was uh, not the shirt to wear on a summer on a, in on the a, middle of <laughs> August. <laughs> you think it was, I look good, but it was bad, and that was, it was just terrible. And um, so uh, <laughs> I had to take the shirt off and walk around in my uh, in my t-shirt because it was just too hot. But anyway, so but it, I, we were down near the front, and we were there with other activists from Cambridge as well, Cambridge Nonviolent Action Committee, because Gloria Richardson was on stage. They gave her one word. We can talk more about that later. Some of the intricacies of what happened behind yeah, the scenes. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to but, we'll get to the day itself in yeah, a second. Uh -huh. But but so I was that year. I was really active in the, in the movement. I had been arrested in Cambridge. I had been beaten up in Cambridge. We were uh, um, organizing here, registering people to vote. So I was deeply involved in the movement during that year. 
Um, and I was gone for part of that summer because I had to be sent away to finish high school and they had to go to a summer school. I was chomping at the bits to get back and I got back and, and, and jumped right into the movement. Um, and, uh, and that, my, that year was, was a movement year for me. I mean, that's what I was doing. Well, and, and so before we get to, to the day, August 28th, I I just kind of want to pause on that for one more second, because again, I'm trying to think about this as a millennial. I'm trying to just imagine what it took to get that many people to DC before the internet, right? How you do that organizing <laughs> and how people get drawn into it. Maybe they see a flyer at a coffee shop or a, you know on their campus somewhere. Uh, word of mouth. I mean, I, I, I guess I just wanted to ask uh, about that, like um, through your eyes, like did you guys feel like it was just a natural thing to get involved in this kind of politics. Were your friends getting involved in it? And and how did you all even hear about the March on Washington? How did how did hundreds of thousands of people hear about it? What? Well, go ahead, you wanna go first? Well, it was a call the, the march was put on by a coalition of organizations. Organizations maybe had a a significance and a uh, in a way that maybe people don't have now. I mean, many people were members of uh, the NAACP or the Student Nonviolent or a co Coordinating Committee, the Urban League, and then the labor movement. The unions were strong. And in fact, uh, when we at, when, at the march itself, I was surprised at the... Uh, the large presence of, of, of unions. I, I, my activity had all been among predominantly black groups uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, public accommodations and things such as that. Uh, uh, the, the group that I marched with from the Washington Monument up to the Lincoln Memorial was mostly labor people. I hadn't fully understood that. So the unions <clears throat> played a big role. Churches played a big role. So people uh, didn't have the Internet, but there were large numbers of organizations that were effective that people participated uh, 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 in. And so um, the uh, I, I remember during one of the planning periods being confused by the name. The name of the March in Washington is the March in Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And I understood the freedom part, but I hadn't fully understood the, the role of the labor movement. I didn't, uh, it, just for some reason that stuck with me. It even it thought to me at one point to suggest, should it be freedom and jobs? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, uh, yes, it, it took me a while to fully understand the, <clears throat> the, the, the employment, the fair employment practices and the jobs in part of the March in Washington. Uh, he, frankly, even afterwards, I, 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 I was still a little, uh, uh, not fully understanding of the name, the March for Jobs and Freedom. And, yeah, I mean... Mark, I know we've we've talked about this a bit of like you know your own past and and how even from a very young age it just you know y your mom instilled in you this sort of sense of justice that that led you to get involved in uh, you know the fight for civil rights right um, and I guess like for for white and non you know basically people beyond. Uh, like black civil rights activists like Larry's talking about, how did you and others get like involved in that struggle leading up to the March on Washington? Well, I mean, one of the things was that the word came out through organizations. You know, we, we, we were in the civic interest group. Um, <clears throat> around the corner was the, um, uh, the NAACP Jackie Robinson Youth League. Um, the NAACP, NAACP headquarters. So, I mean, that's how it got organized. It was through his organizations. People had, they picked up the phone. Uh, they mailed things. <laughs> they had meetings. What's that? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's really different, you know. Um, and and uh, and so it was it was really done in, in, in that way. And I think that... Uh, um, that, that was the big difference. I said, that's how all the people got there. And one of the things that people don't realize about the march, I think, in many ways, 
it was it was really an, a working class march. People don't remember that or even think about that, I think. Working class, not just, A, in terms of the labor unions involved, but the majority of black folks there, whether they were in unions or not, were domestic workers, were farmers, were laborers, church, people coming out of churches. Churches helped organize this thing across, across America. I mean, there were buses that came in from Texas. There were buses that came in from all over the country. And a lot of those buses were done with churches inside the black community. So it was a very different, it, it was, um, it wasn't as some people portray it as some kind of upper middle class, middle class march. These were working people who came to D.C. saying enough is enough. And that was that was kind of a, I think, something that is, does, does not get enough attention. The people like A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, and even King um, had said what were socialists and were not afraid to say they were. You know, and they, this was so there was that was a huge undercurrent there that, that I think history has forgotten. Because what we remember is I Have a Dream, which is a great speech, an incredible, powerful thing that sent people off the, off, the, off the roof. I mean, people loved it. But people forget what was inside that march and what it really meant as a, in a total. Your question to Mark reminds me that Mark, I, is, is, I guess, right. We never regarded, <laughs> we, we never regarded Mark. And I've known for six years. I, I have to be remembered. That's right. That's, that's right. Supposedly. <laughs> I mean, he, this has been our brother <laughs> forever. So let me be clear about that. that yeah, that's right. I keep forgetting that. Is this, back, is this back when you had a ponytail? No, no this is way before the ponytail. No, this is before no, the ponytail. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. You didn't have no, it's no Mark was one of us. Pre ponytail. No, Mark, Mark. Mark was one of us, but anyway. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just like, I, cher I cherish getting to hear about these things, right? Um, because Mark and I, when I mean, we talk about these stories all the time, and I joke with Mark that that uh, he's like the Forrest Gump of the left because every significant event for the past 50 <laughs> years, somehow he was there, right? Um, but so, so like, let's, let's build on that. Let's, let's, go to that day right um because again i mean like you know we for for 60 years we've been hearing stories about um mainly the civil right the state of the civil rights movement the fight for you know against racial segregation against jim crow the fight for full citizenship for black people in this country right that is the dominant sort of overarching frame for which we understand the significance of the March on Washington. But as you both have already laid out, there was a massive component to that of working class struggle, for the struggle for economic justice uh, as well as racial justice. Um, and, and so that already, I think, gives us a really helpful way to, to sort of rethink uh, uh, that moment in history. But now I want to kind of talk about the, the, the scene itself Right. Like, just talk to us about that day, like what it was like going on the bus from Baltimore to D.C. Like, did you did you guys think it was going to be as big as it was? And what was I, it like on the day I, itself? I, I was living in, in Washington right. at that time. I was a <clears throat> student at Howard University and I was the incoming student body president. Uh, so what I remember about that day is that the you the beginning it was close to 14th street uh, near on the, on the grounds of the Washington Monument and so and then the we went up the mall up Constitution a a Avenue all the way to the uh, to the uh, to the Lincoln Memorial and the entire route that uh, at, 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 for me was surrounded mostly by people from labor unions I remember that, and I remember that the, the, the group that I was with was maybe 50% black and white. That was a surprise to me. I, I hadn't fully understood the, 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 the coalition uh, involving uh, labor unions. I, I didn't fully understand uh, the name, March on Washington for Jobs uh, and Freedom. I'd been involved in the freedom part of it. <laughs> but uh, uh, so that, 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 that was a learning um, uh, experience. Uh, we get to the, uh, the grounds of the 
Washington, I mean, of the Lincoln Memorial, this is where the stage was set up and all the speeches uh, uh, were given. I remember the the early phases of the uh, speech, uh, I mean, of the of the speak, speak uh, of the speak, um, speeches. But there's a funny part of how this all ended for me. <laughs> I was at the march in Washington, but I did not hear that I had, I'd have a dream speech by uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, I heard the early speeches, and the, frankly, one of the early speeches I was the was the main speech I wanted to hear, which was John Lewis. Right. I knew John. There had been during the early stages some controversy, some uncertainty as to whether they were going to allow John to speak at all. So I heard him and then a few others, and then I left. <laughs> I went back up to Howard University, and I heard the famous speech all on a little small television set in the offices of the ROTC offices. I mean, no one told me it was going to be, that man was going to give maybe the most famous civil rights speech that ever delivered. <laughs> I'd heard speech, uh, 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 Martin Luther King speak before. He'd, speak, he'd, sp uh, he'd spoken at, at Howard University. So I was at the march in Washington, but I missed the main. But like, I missed the you main. Peaced event. out before MLK I, I, got there. I peaced out before before That's before really we got to that. I I saw this great big crowd. I knew transportation was going to be rough, and so. I went. I went back up to Howard University. So. Hey man, that, that's like exceedingly relatable to me, because <laughs> I'm the guy who's like, all right, let's leave in the fourth quarter of the game right. so we don't get stuck in traffic. Yeah. But then, yeah, like the, to, to then say 60 years later, it's like, yeah, actually, I missed Martin Luther King Jr. speech. So, so my big civil rights experiences. Uh, to sit in in the restaurant where they let us eat, mm -hmm. and I don't have the full <laughs> money for the food, and the march on Washington, and I'll leave before the big speech. <laughs> I'm not very good at this civil rights <laughs> demonstration <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I, I, I needed more practice <laughs> in, 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 in doing this. <laughs> <laughs> can't blame you. You can't blame you. I mean, Mark, what about you, man? What do you, what do you, uh, well, I mean, we, remember we, from the day itself? Well, we took the bus down and we, there were a lot of singing. We were having fun on the bus. We had sandwiches on the bus and people packed chicken and we were just on the bus coming, going down. And, um, and people did a lot of singing on the bus. Um, a lot of freedom songs. And, um, and we were just there at the mall. I mean, one of the things that, you know, we earlier when you talked about jobs and freedom and the name of the march, this, this is not quite what you asked, but it was in my head as soon as you thought about it. Which is, which is, there, there's a, there were a lot of the women were not in the forefront. It was very male dominated, but the women did a lot of stuff, and there was one woman who is the reason why the unions and the civil rights movements came together. And Anne Heatherton, Anne Taylor Heatherton, was that right? And Arnold Heatherton. So she uh, was a black woman, and uh, she had been active in lots of different union organizations and other and other and other organizations that she ran. And she actually brought together King and the unions and and helped formulate the entire change of of uh, of, of what was going to be presented. And so it became this powerful um, message of jobs and freedom now. And I think that that's something people feel it, it, because, you know, it was it was when you heard when you hear John Lewis's speech, one of the things he talked about. And, and also when you heard a Phil Brandoff speech, it was talking about how people were suffering, living low wages, not making any money. Uh, the discrimination against black folks inside unions and also inside of uh, the workplace. And that was a huge theme of this march. Um, and I think that one of the things I think we cannot forget or leave out, this was a really, a real working class march. It was that that's something we just, we just don't, we don't think about, you know? Um, and so, and so, yeah, we were there to the bitter end. And then we took a long time finding the bus. I remember some of us couldn't figure out where the bus was. 
where, where a lot of buses here. Yeah. So which which, which is the bus? <laughs> what bus are we supposed to be on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, and and I, one thing I do remember about that day was when we, we got back to Baltimore. And I it, it took the the, uh, the 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 bus the city bus um, back to my neighborhood. I got off on the corner of Liberty Heights and Garrison, which is my corner where I hung out. Um, and the, the brothers in the corner, um, none of them, and they said, where you been, man, where you been? I said, I was at the March of Washington. And they, I, I talked to them, I said, oh, that's what you tried to get me to go, and I'm not going. We, they didn't want to go because, because they said, because <laughs> their line was, you go out there and pick it and sit in. <laughs> as, as, as Meathead would say, he said, and little Billy would say, <laughs> if some cracker hits me in the head, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> No, they, so that's they, what they said. We'll let you do that. We're not doing that. <laughs> not, 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 not everybody subscribed to the uh, nonviolence. Right. And, and right. Part of preparing for a demonstration is that we would go and everybody would be schooled. That's right. This is what we're going to do. That was a very important part of it. Mark mentioned freedom songs. I wonder if all your listeners understand what they were. There was a whole genre of music. Uh, people know We Shall Overcome, and uh, but ain't gonna let nobody turn, turn me around. Turn, turn, turn me around. Yes, yes. And all woke up this morning with my mind set, set on freedom. freedom. There was a whole uh, <laughs> uh, genre of music there, and there were famous musicians. Uh, Joan Baez was one of them. And, Harry Belafonte. Um, Harry Belafonte and people and singers who uh, freedom songs. And so, yes, we had a whole whole bunch of, uh, of, of, of freedom songs and most of them, a lot of them were, were sung at the marches and in, in demonstrations and music has been a very important, it was huge. Very, very, very important part of it. But that, yeah, that was a, yeah. I remember that day uh, very much and uh, uh, learned. Uh, I'd learned at the, 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 the expansive reach of, of the movement. I hadn't fully understood the, the important role that unions and organized labor. I saw a higher percentage of, of non-African Americans in a civil rights demonstration uh, that I'd ever seen. I mean, I mean, I, I was at Howard University, so understandably, most of the activities that I'd seen have been almost all uh, black, but not always. I mean, not 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 fully. So that was educational, and um, so it was a learning uh, experience and one that that I remembered, and I also learned to stay till the end. Stay, <laughs> stay till the end. Right. You learned many valuable lessons that day. <laughs> well, and, and like, um, and I want to talk about those lessons when we round out in a second, but I guess I just wanted to sort of ask about one historical detail that, that y'all have both touched on. <laughs> Right. I mean, um, you know, we've talked about how the, the the composition of the march, the different organizations from churches to unions to student groups all contributed to to making this event happen. But I know that there's also a lot of um, drama like behind the scenes that that almost meant that the march itself didn't happen. And that has largely been forgotten, right? There, there was a lot of internal politics about what the from what the name of it was going to be to like what the message was going to be to how right. radical that message was going to be. Um, and I know that you know the the White House didn't want it to happen initially. I mean, like, w was there was there a fear that it wouldn't happen or that it would be shut down at any point or just any this anything is... about that that sort of the politics uh, behind the scenes that, that you want to put on the record. We, we had so. multiple competing groups. Yeah. Urban League, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the NAACP, labor movements, or C C Congress of Ra your Farmer, Congress of Racial Equality, just who would be the leaders that would go and meet with the president. This is the genius of buying it rusted. I mean, that, he was the principal organizer. He was the one who could talk to every group. 
and it kept it moving forward and getting it done. And he did it in the name. I mean, the president is A. Philip Randolph because this was A. Philip Randolph's idea back in the 40s, early right. to 41. Um, but the, yes, the, the, there was a lot of attention uh, there, a lot of uncertainty. But the person that I contributed tribute to getting this done was Bayard Rustin. I, I, I agree. I mean, but, but see, it, one of the things that um, there was a lot of tension. I mean, we weren't in the middle of the tension, but we heard about the tension all the time because we knew people who were in the middle of those negotiations, people like Cortland Cox and others who were in SNCC and they were in the middle of it. And the folks who ran the civic interest group in Baltimore were always in constant touch with those guys from SNCC. And so we were aware of that. Um, we were aware that for a while, people like Laurie Richardson didn't want to attend. Um, and even when she did attend, she said one word and that was it. I mean, women didn't speak at that thing. That was something, that's a whole different conversation to have about why that happened. But also they were, that, 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 that it was just, because it was a very male dominated time period, no matter where you were in America. And, and so, um, but inside the groups themselves, you had a lot of union leaders, especially white union leaders, who did not want to see disruptions in the street, didn't want to see sit-ins. <clears throat> they wanted to keep it very civil, and it ended up being civil, but some people really wanted to go take it to the streets. I mean, that's, that's what um, the folks in SNCC wanted to see. You know, they wanted to see people have, sitting down and blocking traffic, and and that's what we all talked about. But we did we didn't do that because there was a we had the kind of discipline of this larger goal in mind, um, and uh, there was a it was yeah it could, it could have not come off. And I think you're right. It was Bayard Rustin, A. Philip Randolph. It, see, these two men <clears throat> were real radicals, and they came out of the movement of the 30s and 40s. They came out of the unions. They came out, and, and Bayard Larson came out of the nonviolent movement. Um, and the early, free, the 19, people forget about the 1949, I think it was 49, Freedom Rides, the first attempted Freedom Rides. And so these were guys who were steeped in, in, in the movement and the struggle. And they also knew how to, they, they knew how to kind of pull people together and bridge these gaps. And so I, I, I agree. I, I give it to the men like Randolph and, and uh, uh, and Rustin for, for, for doing that, to pulling it off, making it happen. And I got, because I could talk to you guys about this for days, but I know we got to we gotta kind of turn, hit the final turn here, but I got two more questions I wanted to ask you while I have the opportunity to ask you, both sitting here on this couch. How closely would you say your personal memory of that day 60 years ago um, resembles the popular memory of that day that we have in our national mythology. And at this point, is it difficult to differentiate between the two, like your personal memory and then like the History Channel version of that day? Do those ever mix? Hmm. Uh, I think the photographers and historians have done a pretty good job uh, I, I mean, of presenting what that day was like. I, I, I don't see a, a major divergence from reality. We're not talking about the background. I mean, that's a different question. But that day, uh, I think that there were a few more people. I think the official record is 250,000. Yeah. I suspect it was a larger group uh, than that. But, uh, but, but, but other than that, the... Uh, the, the, it was re so recorded, so many cameras uh, that that I, I think people have a, were, been able to preserve and to get later a pretty good feel for what happened uh, on 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 you know on that day. Now, what follows is the um, it takes. Um, I mean, the, 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 then then we 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 got. Different things happening to me. The uh, uh, the most dramatic uh, was the uh, bombing of the church that killed the four uh, young girls in um, uh, in Birmingham. Uh, uh, this is actually 
maybe four months later, but for some reason in my head, it's almost like it's the immediate reaction, yeah, response. Yeah. I put the two together. We have this march, and then we have that horrific uh, uh, a bombing. Uh, uh, I was a student body president at Howard University, and uh, we organized, as I'm sure people did other places, a, a, a student, what we thought was going to be a student m- protest march, and... Uh, when that occurred, uh, but then the the university administration and faculty joined in, and, and we at that time were a little upset about that because they seemed to have taken over the march. But now, <laughs> in later years, we understood that they they found this as horrific as we did. But 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 being youngsters at that time, uh, we. we, we we thought they were intruding on, mm-hmm. <laughs> on on our demonstration. No, it wasn't our demonstration. This was something which the whole world uh, felt uh, revulsion to. <laughs> but but young, being young, we didn't fully understand that. And uh, one of my prized possessions is uh, photographs of that. And I'm walking beside Matt James Madison Abbott, the president of Howard uh, University at that time. But that's... That's the event that after that, that then propelled me to, to get involved beyond Howard University. And I became the chairman of something called the D.C. Students for Civil Rights. The, the, the legislative action that follows that becomes the 1964 Civil Rights Act public accommodations, uh, FEPC. There were the demands of the march, but then it had to be put into legislation. And uh, the group that I headed uh, were students from eight colleges and universities around Washington, D.C., where we figured that this was going to be a legislative activity, and so we were from all over the country. So for me, it was the recollection of that bombing and then the next thing is the next spring is the beginning of the effort to pass what became the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So it was now, how, we've had this march, what are we really going to do? I mean, a lot of other things uh, in, in, happened in the interim, but that's the big next year consequence from it, from this march, and the, 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 legislation, the legislation is passed. Mark, what about you? Like, is it is it hard to parse your personal memories from the the national mythology? And like Larry, like what what did where did you go from there? Like in the immediate aftermath of the march. Well, I'm not, my, one of the things I think that did it has, it's really hard. It's not I was going to say disservice, but that's not right. What people remember about the march is King's speech. That's what rings, I think, in most Americans' heads. Well, you said, I mean, it's and, a phenomenal, no, it's an no, objectively I, I, phenomenal I love that speech. speech. <laughs> it's, it's fun, it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, that he was one of the most amazing orators in my lifetime in America. I, he was, and his commitment, and he was this, he was an amazing human being. And I, and, but I, the, the reason that kind of bothers me some is only because there was so much more to it than that. He was the pinnacle of it at the end. Um, and, you know, the, I mean, imagining hundreds of thousands of people in Washington, D.C., no violence took place at all that day. And that's something pe- people need to think about. Also, it was, a, it was a seminal moment that shifted America. People were watching this from all over the country on their television sets. And it, 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 it led to this, as, as, as Larry was saying, it led to... The, the the 1964 civil rights bill and to the and and it began to change things began to change, but we also have to remember that leading up to 19, into that march and after that march, the violence against civil rights workers was intense. I mean, the summer of '64, 26 people were killed in Mississippi alone, and one of them was. So I think I said earlier, Mickey Schwerner, who was in Baltimore for the Gwyn Oak demonstrations and was on our bus, was killed in the mud of Mississippi. Um, and so it, this was a seminal moment that was in the middle of the struggle that would not see come to fruition totally 
until maybe 68 with the Voting Rights Act and more that took place. So, you know, it was, um, I mean, it's, <clears throat> to be part of that moment, I mean, I still remember it vividly. I mean, all of it. I mean, it's just, because it just stays in my head, in my heart. Um, and all the people that, that sacrificed so much to fight segregation, to change America, and that also, look, we're fighting it again. Well, that's what I want to ask about. So, like, the final question here is, um, what's the state of that struggle that brought you guys to D.C. 60 years ago? How do you feel, you know, the, the, the legacy of the fight for civil rights? Like, looking back on it now, where do you think we are? Um, and what do you think that moment 60 years ago means for the fight we have today? Oh, there's been a lot of progress in my view. Yes, so, there has. Uh, Larry Gibson, of, there'll, be no, there'll be no Larry Gibson's is, is the longstanding professor at the University of Law School the, the if there wasn't for the, the civil rights movement the struggles that we yeah, fought. No, no, there's been uh, a tremendous uh, uh, progress. I mean, uh, just imagine, just, just take the military. As we speak, the Secretary of Defense is a black man. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff <laughs> is an African American. Uh, there are lots of things that uh, that are different. I mean, we we we, we in '64, uh, the Public Accommodations Act was very important. Uh, there's been progress made in employment, but that doesn't in many other areas. Um, I write a lot about Thurgood Marshall. Probably the, the greatest disappointment that he would have with the current status of things, of all the battles he thought he, that was over, was the voting rights thing. He, in 1944, had won what he considered his most important case, uh, 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 the uh, Smith versus Allwright, uh, challenging the... Uh, white primary, and he regarded that as his most important case, not, not Brown versus Board of Education. And he delighted in the fact that uh, a couple of years after the march in Washington, he was then solicitor general, and he was able to argue the constitutionality of the Voting, of the voting Rights Act and the, um, the, the damage that the Supreme Court had did the eviscerating for much of the Voting Rights Act and many of the current measures and the uh, to 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 uh, interfere with people's right to vote is of, of all of our in uh, incomplete uh, a task. Uh, my personal hero, Thurgood Marshall, would regard the, the the continued fight for the Americans to be able to vote and their votes to be counted. That's a current battle right now. Uh, yeah. would be most disappointing uh, to him. So I said at the beginning, I think there's been a lot of uh, uh, progress, and some of the battles are pretty much over. But this current effort, which is an attack on democracy, is something that is a little surprising. Uh, I would have thought that that was one battle that we'd won and was over. And I know that would be the view of my personal hero, Thurgood Marshall. It, again, it's, 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 just a, it's, it's a very difficult question. I mean, I think the, the changes that were made in the civil rights struggle fundamentally, fundamentally changed this country on some very positive levels. There are fewer folks that are not black that are ardent racists than there were before. But they're still here. Um, voting rights, public accommodations, the growth of, uh, of the black middle class and black upper middle class in America. Um, all those things are, have changed this country fundamentally. We also have to realize that, that because of the civil rights movement, the right wing, the conservative movement, the right wing conservative movement in this country began organizing effectively in the early 70s, began changing to, 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 to build where they are today. And now we're up against a situation where we are fighting to retain the rights that we fought for then and not let them push it back and to push it forward. So we're in the midst of a different kind of struggle at the moment in America. 
and then you know it's also what we've what we what was built in that period were these the government began programs in the late 60s and early 70s that fundamentally changed the lives of many black people in America they've taken those many of those away and they pushed them back and what they've and, and what has happened in our cities like here we end up with 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 dystopian neighborhoods where nothing is left I mean let me just paint a short picture I won't, I won't belabor it, but let me just be. So, <clears throat> when both of us were young, in the fifties in this country, in the early sixties, and we still had segregation, then the black world was a was a was alive and bustling, with businesses and people living stuck, not allowed to get, leave out of the ghetto, but they were in inner city neighborhoods in black communities, but they were they were thriving on some levels, on some levels. What we've done now is create a world of dystopian inner city neighborhoods where there's no hope. The difference was in the 60s and 50s and 40s and 30s, there was hope because people were struggling to say, we're going to not let you do this to us. We're going to end it and you're not, we're going to end segregation and end your oppression of our people. And what's happened now is there's no hope left in these dystopian neighborhoods. There's no grocery stores. There are no amenities. Houses falling apart. Schools not funded right. So that part of the struggle still has to be fought, for for especially young young African American kids live in poverty, and their families and and Mexican Americans as well, and many other communities in this country. So that struggle continues. Now we're also faced with this right wing surge in America, which really wants to push back everything that we fought for. They want to take it all back. They're very clear about it. I mean, Glenn Beck. I said, I, I, this dawned on me this morning as I was thinking about our conversation today. They actually had the nerve for the 50th anniversary to stage their own demonstration in D.C. trying to claim the March on Washington as theirs. <laughs> I mean, I just want to go smack him, but I didn't do that. But I, 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 <laughs> I would pay to watch Mark Steiner slap Glenn Beck, <laughs> frankly. I, but, but so, so, so it, it, that moment moved us forward. It changed the heart of this country. And we have to continue fighting to maintain what we won and to push it forward. That's where we are now. Well, I think that's as beautiful and uh, of a spot to end on as any. And, I mean, Larry, Mark, I can't thank you guys enough for indulging me once again. And, and, and yeah, giving myself and our incredible Real News audience access to these amazing memories and, and these stories that we don't ever really get to hear. So I just wanted to say... Uh, yeah, on behalf of myself and my generation, thank you um, for for sharing this with us. And uh, Mark, it is still your show, man. So I don't I don't feel comfortable signing off for you, but uh, for the Real News Network, on my part, on this special commemorative episode of the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, it's been a real honor. Mark, take us away. Well, let me just conclude this way. You know, there, there was one civil rights song that we had that I think is opportune for this moment. And it is. You ready? Which one is? Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching down the freedom line. That's the end. We ain't done yet, and they're not turning us around. So, oh, yeah. I remember that one. <laughs> I want to thank my good friend, Larry Gibson. I'm so glad you could do this day, man. Really thank good. you, brother. This thank is really good. Doing. And Max, thanks for taking over and doing this. And so this is Mark Steiner thanking Cameron Grandino and Adam Coley behind the scenes here for making this show work today. Without them, this stuff wouldn't happen. And we thank you all for joining us. And keep tuning in. Write to me at mss at the Steiner Show dot org. No, that's wrong. MSS at the real news.com, excuse me, had the wrong email address. Write to me and let you know what you thought, and I will write right back to you and tell me what you'd like us to cover. So I'm Mark Steiner here for the Real News Network. Thanks for joining us and take care. Thank you so much for watching the Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, Tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.